Well, welcome back to the first of the careers panels during this uh, Centre Court uh, Specialised Masters Festival. Whether it's the future of finance, uh, big data, or becoming a, a global business leader, um, what do you want to be? What do you want to do uh, in, in the next stages of your personal and professional development? Um, one of the schools said we get more questions about careers than we do about GMAT or in anything else. So uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome a panel that hopefully can answer many of those questions. You won't need the FAQs at all. Uh, we're joined from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts with uh, Michelle Lee. Uh, Michelle is the director of the Masters in Business Analytics at uh, MIT Sloan. Uh, also with us, uh, Agnès Cognier-Loigerot. Uh, Agnès is the Global C Director of Career Development, Talent Development at INSEAD. So of course, Agnès, today we'll be talking about Masters in Management. Last week we were talking about MBAs and we'll, the two of us hopefully will be able to get that straight. Uh, we also have from uh, EDEC, uh, Liliana Stolova, uh, responsible for international admissions. Great to have you with us, Liliana. Uh, Julie Sapede, who is the head of careers at ESCP Business School, the world's oldest business school, but attracting some of the top youngest talent. Uh, and from, uh, from the UK, uh, Megan Camacho, who is a careers consultant for the Imperial College Business School. Thank you, all five of you, for joining us for Centre Court. I guess we'll be focusing primarily on uh, the Masters in Management uh, and the Masters in Business Analytics. Now, th these are two uh, either pre-experience or early stage masters that have just exploded in popularity uh, in the last few years. Um, starting perhaps, uh, Michelle, with you. We live in this, uh, this world of big data, um, but you know, why do you think uh, that Biz Analytics has become such a, a popular choice for aspiring graduate students? Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Matt. Uh, so business analytics uh, has been growing in popularity in recent years with the increase in the amount of data that's available to both companies, organizations, and students, and even universities. Uh, so with the explosion of data, businesses have now needed to uh, hire more students from universities with these tools coming straight out of graduate school or undergraduate school. And so we see students really prepare for what the industry really wants, which is more technical abilities in, in programming, in quantitative sciences, in mathematics, um, and in analytics. Right, so, so that, that real focus on data and being able to interpret and join the dots on, on data. Uh, INSEAD is a school, uh, and yes, that of course has uh, an MBA, you have a, a post experience masters in finance among others, but, but you'd never had all of these 22 and 23 year olds showing up on the campuses of Fontainebleau and, and, and Singapore. You launched the masters in management, uh, it, the first pioneer cohort arrived last month. Um, what, what was the demand that you were seeing with that view to building an international career? Well, when we looked at this um, market, I think indeed what we need these days in the organizations is in general are these young people who have this strong appetite for learning, uh, this growth mindset, um, and and how to engage in very large uh, systems. So I think the current generation is very much like that, very open to learn, to, 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 to test, uh, to experiment, and that's very much, and especially these days, what the organizations are looking for. But they do not only look for people who are able to learn quickly and adapt and be agile and resilient and so on, which is becoming even more important for any leaders, but they're also looking for, of course, people who know how to um, manage how to interpret uh, and analyze all the information and the data that they are coming their way, whatever the role, because now you have data in every role. And that's why organizations are also trying to upskill their employees. So it's a fascinating an, uh, environment these days where p organizations are wondering, uh, do we hire fresh people? Do we upskill our people? Uh, internally, and so it appears that uh, they very much look forward to engaging with this generation 
uh, that seems to have been able to navigate uh, this complexity so far and even more now. So we believe with our program um, and the MEME uh, program and the current students we are working with that um, we will be able to equip them with not only these digital skills, tech skills, um, technology in general, AI, etc., but also with these soft skills that are very much important to be able to then climb the ladder very quickly, which are related to resilience, as I mentioned, but it's also related to understanding uh, an organization from the inside. So really looking at power and politics and influence uh, really, I mean, being able to look at, uh, at the structure, the future of work, so really tapping into uh, the current evolution, the current transformation. So having a new meme in, these, in this environment and unique context these days uh, is definitely the right timing for them to be able to, to be successful. Right. So this, this generation of business leaders that know how to code, there's all, all that section on the resume of Python and C++. Um, Julie, of course, uh, ESCP has been training uh, or teaching business for, what, 201 years. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, <laughs> obviously you uh, adapt uh, the, the different master's programs that, that you have. Was, was it a natural step to then launch a, a business analytics to reflect the market needs? Yeah, completely, because it's a high demand and uh, uh, from the recruiters and, of course, our historical degree, a master in management. Uh, we have students with the, those double skills, but uh, it was uh, um, almost a mandatory for the job market now to have experts being able to manage uh, both business and data at a high level. So, yeah, it's uh, been two years now that we have this new program, but it's uh, highly Highly welcome from the recruiters in France and all over the world. By the way, have, have we worked out, you know, we've got the MBA, that's three letters. We've got the MIM, that's three letters. What are we going to call a master's in business analytics? Because it takes up half the line in the articles that I write. Do we have a short version to describe a, an, an MSBA? What are, we can't call it an MBA, but we've already got one of those. Do you have a short name for it at ESCP? Uh, for us at ESCP, we call them MBD, Master in Big Data. MBD. MBD. Great. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, so we'll push that. So it works fine with MBD. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, uh, Megan, people show up in, uh, in the careers office at uh, Imperial, or, or perhaps even the application process. You have a suite of, of different programs from climate change to uh, marketing programs. As, as we focus for this panel on the Masters in Management and, and Business Analytics, do applicants already know what they want and the skill sets that they want to develop? Or, or is that a dialogue that you and colleagues in the admissions team have with them? Yeah, um, many of them do have dream companies or top 10 employers that they know they want to focus on and go or places that they were hoping to get into. But oftentimes, you know, they, they come to us and they say, I don't know, do I do finance or consulting or something totally different? And so that is very much a conversation that we have with them about, you know, what is it that you enjoy to do? Where do you see your skills? Um, some programs have things like strength finders built into them so they can understand a bit more about their profile and, you know, what makes them a good leader or what skills would they like to further develop? So we do have conversations like that as well. And I think that's always so rewarding when you see a student who thinks, you know, I, I could go one way or the other. And then by having those conversations, they identify, you know, what it is they really love and what they want to do. And of course, you know, we go through the whole journey with them of preparing the application, preparing for the interview. So when they come back to you with the good news that they got the role, you've, you've, you've been on that roller coaster with them. So that's always such a rewarding experience. Right. And so do you start with the idea of where do you see yourself two, three years from now and, and work backwards? Do they already have that sense of clarity of next steps in their career? Yeah, they do ha usually have some ideas of that. I think that because students, of course, in all of our universities are just so ambitious, they have, you know, big dreams, big goals for themselves. So sometimes they almost take on too much and they're thinking too far ahead because sometimes it's just about getting your foot in the door and, and what step can get you into the direction that you want to go in the future. Because many of these roles are transferable skills. You know, many of these industries are also interested in people that have other backgrounds. Um, I think that's one great thing about employers these days is 
you know, if you think about like investment banking or finance in general, they usually were very much, you need to be a finance background, a finance internship. And now they're asking for things like the programming and the coding that you mentioned. They're talking about, um, you know, have you been an engineer before? Well, great, come join our team. And that would never have been thought of 20 years ago. So I think that also helps us to be able to encourage our students to think outside of those traditional career paths and to think about where they can use their skills in different ways in different companies and organizations. Right. At, uh, Liliana, at uh, EDEC, uh, you also have a, a, a great uh, master's in uh, finance program. I had no idea what I wanted to do at 22, let alone, well, I think I'm still struggling now, but um, uh, as, as you look at the programs, do you see what uh, Megan was describing in terms of individuals? They're looking at their background, you know, undergrad, whatever they studied, and thinking, ah, this is the natural next step to, you know, to get a master's and get these specific skill sets. Well, we do have all sorts of candidates, uh, those that come with a very clear vision and ambition and even a company where they know they want to work at a few years uh, from now, but we also have those who are still in the process of doing that. And that's why I think the Master in Management is such a great format because it allows students to actually uh, dedicate uh, one year to foundation studies, uh, to get the basics of business management if they come from a different background then have a whole year for professional experience if they so wish or combine with exchange. So that gives them time to actually experience the, um, the practical side of uh, their studies uh, to an internship and then go to their advanced specialization, which is the final year. But also for those who already have a clear idea, they can jump straight into the advanced specialization and do it in, in one year. So, I mean, it's true that, you know, being focused and knowing what you want is very important, but it's um, it's not evident to, to everyone. So there are people who are looking for double competencies, those who are looking at career changing path. So um, that's why the Master in Management is really a great formula that can accommodate different types of uh, backgrounds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I once asked a, a McKinsey recruiter, you know, what they were looking for. Of course, there, there are many, many aspects to that. Um, he talked about um, humility, which I was very encouraged by as a characteristic. He talked about uh, people skills. And Michelle, he also then talked about analytics, this, this world of big data and trying to make uh, sense of all of that data. Now, McKinsey, of course, is present uh, all over the world. As you then look at uh, individuals coming into uh, the Sloan program, do they reflect a global appetite for those analytic skills or is it is it particularly prevalent in the US market? Do you think that they'll be able to take these skill sets and pursue careers all over the world? Um, yes, definitely. It is definitely a global perspective that we take at MIT Sloan. We partner with McKinsey and BCG and um, firms all over the world, not just in the United States. And certainly in this tough uh, political climate right now, we are seeing international students who once wanted to stay in the United States going back to their home countries. So we are trying to train our students to be as flexible as possible um, and to be able to adjust to you know, a pandemic or a political unrest. As far as our uh, skills go, our most important skill that we look for is coachability. So we look for students who are receptive, as you said, and open to receiving feedback and being able to communicate these very complex ideas and complex algorithms. We're not just trying to train students to code behind a, a, a desk all day long. We are trying to train the next leaders of our generation in data science and in business analytics. So we're looking for leadership qualities, but also for this key quality, which is coachability that uh, we think is really important. Right, I, I think when on the admissions panel that we have with your colleagues, I'll, I'll ask them how they, how they then look for that sense of, uh, you know, being very porous coachability and how they then adapt those skills. Uh, and yes, I'm gonna get in trouble with a friend of mine, a senior partner at Bain, if we've mentioned McKinsey and BCG and we didn't mention Bain, so there I've, I've, I've said Bain. Um, but beyond MBB, big four, big banks, big companies around, around the world, um, of course you have a long tradition with uh, MBA graduates working for those companies. Do you think that MBB and others are looking for 
different skill sets out of a master's in management graduate or simply at that earlier stage of their career and perhaps the coachability that Michelle was describing? I think, I think even for these uh, entry roles, um, these soft skills now are very much uh, sought after. So it means that it's this importance of having candidates who can definitely show team spirit, ability to collaborate with people from different levels, not only with uh, um, uh, colleagues, but ability to influence without authority. So this art of communication, this art of giving, receiving feedback, for instance, uh, and of building relationships uh, in, a, in a trusted uh, way and, and with long-term uh, outcomes is, is definitely very important. So um, what we deliver during uh, the MIM program and even from the very beginning, because as we've been piloting this year for the, the, the new MBA class, we started uh, with the same idea for the meme uh, very early on some months ago, even before the crisis hit us, which is we need to make sure that they get equipped with these uh, uh, key soft skills, understanding themselves very early on about what it is they are strong at so far, what they may be looking at so that they can make the most of these group work that they have to do during the program. And they can also pitch and make good impressions about all this when they engage because they have to engage very early on with our I MIM mean, program, the way it is structured. So that's why we had quite an intense uh, pre-MIM program online. So we are leveraging the blended learning uh, process as well. And they've been learning about art of communication. They've been learning about coding. They've been learning about all the job search concepts and tools, exploring themselves, exploring the market, and then understanding the different steps for how to become a successful job uh, seeker. So that when they're now are in the program, they can make the most of what they learn during the core courses, but they can already also um, understand more of the, of the specificities for each functional area because they have these practicals where they will get to work on very specific projects. Um, and it's also not only related to data or marketing, but also organizational behavior and culture. And then they can leverage all this when they already engage now with um, MBAs, with alumni and with uh, uh, all the employers that we bring in virtually um, every month. When I think about the structure, the creativity, uh, the rigor that all of you and, and your schools bring uh, to, to, to networking, to you know, self-awareness and analysis, to the skill sets and how they might play out, you know, um, colleges and universities themselves provide uh, some sort of career services. But I mean, you guys are just in a different league. I mean, really, the, the, the level of support that you provide. Now, Julie, of course, you're delivering that support uh, in London and in Turin and in Madrid and in Poland and you know, six campuses around Europe. As we look at the job market of 2020, it's a tough market, but perhaps also as, as you look ahead you know, to, to, to next year uh, and sort of talent requirements uh, that companies are telling you that they're looking for, are, are you optimistic about the year ahead? I'm quite optimistic for the job schools that we represent uh, in here. That that's the huge difference uh, for students when they choose uh, an education is, of course, the uh, networking we have and relationship with key partners. Uh, you mentioned some of uh, the big uh, companies, uh, and and most of them when they decided to. Um, maintain or not some jobs. Luckily for us, our jobs were mostly maintained. So our students are quite well um, preserved from the situation. Um, also due to the fact that we have, like uh, Agnes mentioned, uh, soft skills uh, and, and, and being able to uh, uh, make them adapt to the situation and learn the skills that are needed nowadays and we had to adapt of course of course um, most of the recruiters european wise they are still optimistic as well 
for sure, some of them have postponed some of their recruitment for two or three months because uh, they don't know exactly what's going on in the few months and the, especially in some jobs related to uh, very sensible data, let's say in finance or uh, they cannot uh, work from home for students for internships. So th there's been a, a bit of a, a waiting list now, <laughs> but everyone's optimistic that things will uh, resume in a few months, hopefully. Yeah. Liliana, do, do you share uh, Julie's optimism and, and also given the transferable sector skills, you know, whether it's analytics or uh, the sort of um, masters in management, even the masters in finance, uh, you know, as, as you look at data needs for healthcare, supply chain, uh, you know, aviation is uh, struggling to get back off the ground again. But as you look at different sectors, uh, do, are you seeing changing uh, hiring needs across those sectors? Sorry. Uh, so for sure, there is a, an impact on uh, certain industries. Uh, I mean, it's greater than in others. Um, our students uh, of last year, some of them have been impacted in terms of uh, the internship start, which is either been postponed uh, or started uh, virtually, which in some cases, as uh, Julie mentioned, it's not possible. Um, so, and again, they're missing out on you know, you know, the face to face interaction. Some of them are uh, restricted to traveling, so literally they cannot uh, join their, um, their place of work. Um, but at the same time, we're hearing a lot of positive uh, feedback. Uh, the, you know, this exciting time to, to learn new things, uh, exciting time to go back uh, to your studies. Uh, so even though some students have been impacted uh, professionally to, to begin their internships, um, still um, there is a lot of positive uh, feedback uh, from, from the whole process, uh, the education process as a well. whole. And uh, w when I did my studies, I actually started in the middle of the uh, subprime crisis. And uh, it was an exciting time to learn because we were learning in real time. And uh, it also showed um, a lot of uh, systemic issues. Um, and in terms of uh, work, um, it showed which companies are adapting. Um, so this is a true test and it's a true opportunity for students to learn. So even if they need to postpone um, their practical uh, experience with a few months, uh, still most of them seem to be uh, very happy um, to be able to follow programs from a distance and not have a full gap year of postponing their studies altogether. Um, but uh, yeah, to go back to your initial question, um, indeed some industries are more heavily impacted, especially the tourism and event industries, uh, for example. And, and, and Agnes spoke, to, of course, to hard skills that, that you're providing, but also some of those soft skills and even uh, attitude, you know, just in terms of uh, adaptability and resilience in, in, in this current market. If, if you had to identify one or two characteristics that you think recruiters see in this class of 2020, given everything that they've had to adapt to, what, what would those characteristics be? For me, uh, and this is not new necessarily, but now more than ever, it would be strategic thinking. Uh, this is the skill that um, most programs uh, that we have are focused on teaching, uh, specifically because this is uh, something that is really important for career development, for problem solving, for pretty much everything. So long-term strategic thinking in a, in a very uh, volatile environment. Right. Uh, Megan, the most popular story on Poets and Quants in the last 10 days um, has been about the business analytics program at Imperial, where you have, uh, I think, what is it, uh, nearly 4,000 initial applications, close to 2,000 completed applications for 85 places. You know, the, the Stanford's MBA suddenly looks like it's, you know, a public library compared to <laughs> that level of selectivity. Are you and the careers team involved with the admissions team to then identify 85, 90 uh, individuals and, and thinking about the sort of uh, next career steps that they'll be making. Is, is there a dialogue with the two departments are working together to make those choices? 
answer is yes, we do help to support the admissions team when they need on um, you know interviews and, and selection. I have to say they've they've got a great team in place and and usually manage most of that. But it, it, yeah, it's very exciting to see the applications that come through and the the caliber of candidates that we get. Many of them um, do come from experience backgrounds or are coming from say industry or career changes because they now want to move into data analytics or you know I saw someone the other day who actually he has a role and he's been in that role for quite a while he already did an MSc and an MBA he came back to Imperial and decided he wanted to do the business analytics as well because his role is changing during these times and is much more heavily focused on data so I think that also makes the mix of students very interesting given that they have such a variety of backgrounds and and are very educated often as well Right. It puts the pressure on you to come up with a program 10 years from now that he wants to come back and complete the collection, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, Ho hopefully that speaks well for us that he decided to come and do another degree on top of that. So, um, yeah, so it yes, might, it's, it, it might yeah. Be, it might be climate change. We, uh, you know, who knows where we are uh, from, from <laughs> 10 years from now. Um, uh, Michelle, as, as you look at employers, because you know the, you work with uh, the consulting, but you know, there's, there's Fortune 500, and, the, and then there's perhaps more niche. Do you find that uh, graduates are very um, eclectic and curious in the sort of next steps that they want to explore? Uh, yes. Well, certainly right now, graduates are definitely being more open to their next steps because right. it's harder to find a full-time placement at the moment. Um, but certainly the opportunities are vast and still very strong for for analytics minded students and we see anywhere from the spectrum of you know fortune 500 companies as you mentioned certainly the in retail the consumer packaged goods is doing really strong right now amazon walmart procter and gamble um, and then we see also startups in the in the analytics arena uh, still going strong. So we have we've had a lot of students go into entrepreneurship and um, leading the charge in data science within a smaller startup. Um, we also have healthcare uh, pretty strong right now. So um, you know with the the research ongoing in coronavirus. Uh, we have a, a number of students going into the healthcare industry to help with the coronavirus efforts um, mm -hmm. and transportation is, is still quite strong. We've seen um, the luxury sector go, go down a little bit and uh, high tech, um, some of the uh, uh, marketing or, or technology related companies are, are seeing a, a pause in their hiring. And, and in the, the sort of the support that you're providing to your Sloan students, how much do you fix on that first position coming out of the uh, business analytics program versus, well, this will be a stepping stone. You know, th this will be a great consolidation and the experience that it will be bringing. But are you already having that discussion with them about where they might see themselves five, seven, ten years from now? Yeah, so our program is an earlier, is an early career program. So on average, students are 22 or 23 years old. Similar to our Master of Finance program, we have two main early career programs. Um, our program is 60 students, and the Master of Finance program is 120. Uh, we keep really close track of our students. We know that they might not stay in their job right after graduation um, for long term. Typically, it's two or three years. Um, and like Megan, our students tend to come back uh, either for an MBA or an executive degree down the road. Uh, so we keep really close contact with our students and also we help them with recruiting for their lifetime. Uh, so we have a lifetime career services team that uh, network with our alumni and provide alumni services to them, whether it's reviewing their resume, reviewing you know, what their next step might be. Uh, so I think that's a key benefit uh, of being an alumni at MIT is this lifetime opportunity. Well, you, it sounds like you've got, got everything, work, whether it's at Imperial where they keep coming back to take a different master's degree or they keep coming back to Sloan for that lifetime of, uh, of career support. And, and of course, all of you have phenomenally loyal uh, alumni uh, and the experience that you've provided for them, which uh, makes them such great ambassadors. Uh, Agnes, 50% um, of INSEAD MBA graduates have looked to start a business in the five or 10 years, typically uh, outside of the MBA. 
Do you think that with the younger masters in management, much like the profiles that Michelle was describing, will you see many more entrepreneurs, you know, at the age of 23 saying, what the heck, you know, I'm going to start a business. Why, why not? The opportunity cost is low. Are you going to see a whole generation of MIM entrepreneurs? I think so, yes. Uh, I don't know yet uh, to what extent, of course. Uh, it's too early to say. Um, there's still very much lots of interest on, on the big brands, on main sectors, which we can totally understand because it's indeed a, a great stepping stone when, you're on, when you don't really know yet exactly where you want to be five years down the road. So, uh, and, and given the future of work and so many changes that take place, so why not going into something that can just equip you even more? Uh, it's mm. a kind of post-meme experience going to consulting. You continue to learn lots of different functions, projects, uh, sectors. So, of course, it's an amazing stepping stone. Um, but uh, from what we, from the conversations we're having with the current meme and, and, and the prospects as well, so we definitely have a lot of would-be entrepreneurs in the room for sure. Um, and that's why also I believe that by joining NCA, they know that they join a community of entrepreneurs or at least of, of alumni who are very much involved in entrepreneurship. Half of them are involved somehow, which means not specifically as an entrepreneur, but as an investor, as part of a, a, a director of a business uh, uh, or of an incubator or accelerator or many different forms of uh, entrepreneurship and many different hubs out there. And so we are, of course, uh, very much connected to the different ecosystems. So it's not only Singapore, it's also now the increasing ecosystems in Indonesia, for instance, so for entrepreneurship, but also for Berlin, Amsterdam, or San Francisco, New York, etc. So we have this amazing network uh, of uh, entrepreneurship related uh, people that students can tap into. And they know that, so that's why when we have already some discussions. Some are very much aware as well, uh, aware already of the, the VC ecosystems, for instance. So um, they have quite a pretty uh, understanding on how it works, how the different uh, connections are made between these players within the ecosystem. Uh, so it's very interesting. I think it, it comes from where they uh, come from as well uh, and so they have been exposed to lots of different businesses even if they have only one year of experience they have done a lot of different projects and 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 some of them have tried out uh, what it is being an entrepreneur or working for two or three months with a startup um, as the best way to maybe learn quickly many different things uh, in one go instead of doing a formal internship somewhere so very interesting experiences uh, that could help them go there <laughs> at some point. In, in terms of that mix, Julie, because of course, uh, you know, ESCP is one of the prestigious grandes écoles, uh, and, and you have, you know, the, the, those early stage career, the masters in management, but you know, that Paris campus could have uh, exec MBA students, exec ed programs. So, so there's, you know, generations that are coming onto your campuses. Is that something from a careers perspective? that you can nurture so that the interaction between those early stage masters in management or business analytics individuals are mixing with people that might have 15 or 20 years of a career behind them in the CAC 40. Is, is that a chemistry that works well? We, we work on that, at least. Uh, we're working on that, for sure. Uh, we, we offer our alumni and executives the ability to mentor and uh, uh, be close to the youngest, uh, not only to recruit them, but to help them grow in their career. And this is something uh, highly valuable for both of them because uh, I, we, we tend to think that it's helpful for the youngest, but uh, the youngest have so many things to bring to the, to the other ones. Uh, thanks to uh, new, new generation, they master some tools and the way of thinking and agility that is an asset as well. So yes, we, we try as much as possible to mix them. Of course, nowadays it's been, it, this year it's been more complicated because, right. Uh, right. Uh, well, I think we all experience that right now. Uh, but yeah, 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 it's very important. And um, you were talking about entrepreneurship. We have a very active uh, incubator at the school, which is uh, very central in the Paris place. And um, we do welcome 
uh, multi-generational uh, people and it's really an asset for everyone because uh, it shows the students that you can do it through your career whenever you want and um, and most of them now like Anis uh, mentioned they, they they tend to do everything in between uh, every time they have a few a few moments they will try out one idea and and uh, it's very difficult for us to track all the ideas that come out of the students right now and uh, we try to 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 make a, a, like an ecosystem that can speak together but it's getting complicated because uh, the, the youngest they, they they do 10 things at a time and uh, experience things is something very important rather than knowledge i mean knowledge is important of course well yeah. <laughs> here we are uh, but the experience between, is uh, the, what makes the a difference mentoring and the reverse mentoring and networks and incubators. I mean, yes, as you say, just keeping track of so much energy and, and ideas. If, if, if we look at a career trajectory, Liliana, uh, how, how do you then structure uh, experience and experiential learning? Uh, uh, internships, do they play a, an important role? You know, we, actually... Yes, yes, it's mandatory in all our programs to have not an internship, but a professional experience because in some countries it's not in the form of internships and even uh, during this year in um, if they wanted to go abroad uh, the school couldn't afford internship because it's not allowed from our uh, policy so students mm. have managed to find some contract local contracts and they they when they were highly motivated they did it i mean you you can say no but uh, it's not it's not um something they will listen <laughs> and they, they, yeah. some of them i've found ways to uh, bypass the system and uh, find opportunities uh, international opportunities um yeah but Fine. we do we do in all the programs uh, even mbas can do an internship if they are willing to uh, especially to enter a new market or uh, uh, due to visa issues as well because it's getting more complicated uh, we, we're talking about agility mobility worldwide but uh, most of our countries are shutting down the, the the and it's getting more and more complicated for young graduates to uh, move from one country to another I'm not talking about the pandemic, but uh, the regulations that every country apply uh, more and more. I mean, it's it's getting tough for them to move, and uh, but they are highly motivated and they know it's an asset for their career, so they 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 put things into actions. Yeah, that's that's where that attitude of finding a way will uh, will serve them so so well. Uh, Liliana, at, 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 in terms of um, internships as part of the program, um, do you offer uh, internships, and if so? Do you notice a difference in the students before the internship and then when they come back, you know, they're applying things perhaps that they've learned? Is it like a, an aha moment and, and you see a, a newfound confidence as they return to campus? Well, as I said, um, that depends on the program because for uh, the two-year program, the internship is integrated in between the two academic years. Um, so that's, uh, that's really uh, useful for those who are going to mix uh, academic and professional experience within the program. And then there is the one year program, which has an end of studies internship, which is about four to six months. Um, so it would be the career center who would follow up thoroughly with those students. So I don't necessarily have a you know, detailed vision on each and one of them on the statistical reports or those uh, with whom I keep in touch. Uh, right. So those who do the two-year program and come back on campus for the second academic year that then go to Cardinal University but stay with us. Uh, indeed, they, they just become much more confident. Uh, uh, you know, knowledge and experience just uh, brings confidence, that's for sure. Right. Uh, for right. some of them, what is interesting is that after the um, gap year for professional experience, they may decide to fine-tune uh, their chosen career path. So they would uh, maybe choose another specialization based on the project they were involved in. Um, so that could be really useful. Uh, but uh, yeah, in, in the end, I think the, this format of the master management program, um, that's why it's so appealing to students, is because at the end of your studies, um, you have solid experience on your uh, resume. So you have uh, something to show for, you're much more competitive on the job market. Uh, but for those who, uh, simply do the one year they already have some experience prior to joining so their end of studies internship very uh, easily joined um, very easily 
um, transformed into a um, permanent position, uh, or they already have some contacts within the chosen industry. So for them, it's, uh, it's very easy to find a job. So for those who have almost no professional experience to begin with, this format uh, is uh, very useful because, as I mentioned, the confidence, but also just the experience uh, itself is just uh, yeah. I suppose back to this this idea, Megan, of you know knowing who we want to become and and, and what we want to do. It, it's a generation uh, that very often has a very strong sense of purpose. You know, they're not just looking for well rewarded careers, exciting careers, but that you know, will have positive uh, impact. Is is that something that you see? And how do you then, as as a careers team, um, help them to perhaps even manage expectations? Yeah, that is absolutely something that we see. I think company values are becoming much more important to this generation. Um, and even looking at things like their sustainable impact, um, you know, how they're contributing to things such as climate change. You know, we have a climate change program as well. Um, but even just across the board and across the programs, this is important to that generation, definitely. So, you know, one thing we always encourage them to do is to speak to people that are working in those organizations that they're interested in to, you know, find out what the company values are, how does the company talk about them, how do they display them in the presentations that they may give, or what, how do they see it in the company culture. I think that's an important question that we encourage students to ask as well, is just, you know, how would employees describe their company culture? And students can take that information on board and, and think about does that align with their values and what's important to them. Um, and so, yes, we definitely do see that as much more of a focus. Um, you know, we do have students that sometimes come to us and say, I don't want to work for, you know, Fortune 500 or big data or whoever, you know, the MBBs, just because they have, sometimes they have a perception of them just because they assume that all big companies are the same. So we, you know, it's also the flip side where we encourage them to do, do the research and to find out is what you think actually true? Because many companies are changing the way they do business and are much more focused on that, um, you know, having a positive impact on the world and on the environment and those things that are important to that generation. So somebody sits down in front of you, or maybe at the moment it's all on, on Zoom, um, yeah. and, and they say, Megan, I know what I, I know where I don't want to work. Yeah. I just don't know I've where I that. do want to work. How, how, where, where do you start with that conversation? Yeah, I usually ask them why they don't want to work for a particular company. So what is it that, that they think makes them not want to work for them? Um, because sometimes it's about, you know, challenging them. Is that true or is that a, just the perception they have? Have they actually done the research to, to know that that's, that's the truth? Um, you know, and sometimes it's they just don't know enough about those companies as well. So then if that's the case, we encourage them. Why don't you go away, do some research, see if we have alumni or see if you can connect with people on LinkedIn. And, and then if they say, you know, I don't know where to start, but I know it's not here, then then it's about, you know, okay, well, what is it that you're interested in? Where do you see your strengths? What is it that you enjoy doing? And how can those things be implemented into, you know, the employers that we may know of? Or can we connect them with people? Because, you know, most of us have been here a few years, so we can remember previous students that we might be able to introduce them to and say, this person was also in your shoes. Why don't you have a chat with them? Uh, you know, certainly putting them in touch with, with the different groups that we're connected to as well. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it's okay if you don't know, if you're not sure, that's fine. You're, you're starting out, you're probably still pretty young, definitely younger than I am. So you've got time to explore that. And we always encourage them, you know, this year is your year to try as many new things as you can to ask all of the questions. You know, there's no silly or stupid questions. You, you can't really mess up this year because this year is about, you know, putting yourself out of your comfort zone and just finding out as much as you can about everything so that you can make a really well-informed decision about your career and where you want to go next. Right. J Julie, I see you smiling. That, 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 I mean, that idea of knowing what you want or perhaps sometimes as importantly, knowing what you don't want, but, but it's the opportunity to explore. Yeah, completely. And most of the time they want to follow the group and uh, because uh, consulting in strategy is so good or finance is so good, but uh, they have they have many, many opportunities, even in finance. Uh, last year, we because all the students and all the keywords they were looking for uh, internship was M&A, we, we did a, a round table with uh, big companies saying finance is not only M&A. 
please <laughs> open up more and go find some more opportunities. And it was a huge success. And we did the same with consulting. Like consulting is not only strategy and etc. We declined it with different format. And uh, yeah, because students, they, they tend to follow the, 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 the main group and they all want to do the same. And there they are huge opportunities. And even nowadays, what we hear with the media is that the economy is, is in difficulty. Yes, of course, we know that. We all experience that in our daily lives, right? But there are many, many sectors that are doing very well, even are struggling because in the past six months, they doubled their activities and they, they, they are struggling to find new resources. So uh, we always teach the students to have plan A, B, C, etc. And now, now is the time to experience new way of working and uh, new structure. And um, there are plenty of, op of opportunities. Of course, it might not be in the first sector that they wanted to go uh, in, in the previous uh, before, uh, but but it's working very well and uh, we have some huge partners recruiting a lot and facing some big challenges because it's as difficult for a company to double their activity than to decrease the activity it's it's also very challenging and complicated and so our students uh, are very well equipped for that situation so we push them in this in this situation and in to experience that and to uh, travel differently. We had a discussion with some students today because they said, I cannot go outside Europe. It's getting complicated. And I said, well, go and discover your own treasures in our countries, smaller companies who are struggling to, 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 to increase their activity because the demand is it, it's here and because they want to expand internationally as well. And they are looking for candidates just like you, young, agile, and uh, able to face new challenges. So there's, there's also a, a lot of opportunities right under mm -hmm. their nose, but they tend to follow the big marks that uh, I understand. It's, it, it's mm -hmm. not just finance M&A. In fact, uh, Michelle's colleague, uh, Heidi Pickett, who um, is the Associate Dean for the Masters in Finance, you know, points out that finance will contribute to solving many of the world's thorniest problems, you know, whether it's, it's healthcare or other uh, issues. Michelle, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. 2020 is, a, is unlike other years. And, and if we were to go back a year or two years, I'm sure that Sloan graduates from the Masters in Business Analytics actually face choices as they come out of the program. They, you know, they will receive multiple offers. And, and let's hope that, you know, that that situation soon returns uh, next year. How do you then support them as a careers team to, to look at those different options and, and, you know, make a choice, perhaps not just about brand uh, and you know, corporate image, but about fit and, uh, and their own sense of values. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Matt. Well, I think the most important aspect of our program is we have a seven month practicum project called the Analytics Capstone Project. So our entire program is only 12 months. It goes from September to September, but we have an analytics capstone project, which goes from January till August. And that's uh, like an extended co-op slash internship program where students can really be part of a real company and be an intern in the company and work full time. So they can try out to see if they really like working at, you know, the, the big fortune 500 or working at an, a smaller startup and oftentimes they will receive return offers from those capstone companies that we work with. But they will also receive offers from other companies as well. So we help to advise students in a multitude of ways. Um, we help them evaluate their, their offers, look at timing of responses. Um, we've seen companies really push students in as shortest of a time frame as in one or two days to respond to an offer. And we really advise the students to push back and think deeply about if that's the offer they really want or if they could extend those deadlines. Um, and then also we look at the uh, the offer, what is in them, and how, how can they negotiate a higher offer? How can they uh, ask for more benefits or ask for a different location of their uh, assignment? So those are all services that we provide at MIT to our students um, across the board, not just for business analytics, also for MBA students. Um, they negotiate yeah. a, 
as they negotiate a good healthcare plan, they mustn't forget to include the helicopter that will take them from one place to another. That's become a, a very high demand in the US uh, these days. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yes, as, as you look at a newly launched program, how it reflects today's market, is there one module, one course in, in the Masters in Management that, where you say, I'd love to take that class and, and why? If myself, I would like to take one of these classes. So you, 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 you can choose any one of those classes. What, what, what would you choose? Well, I think uh, I would probably hesitate because I'd like definitely to know more about data and uh, how to manage all these data in a responsible and ethical way. Uh, and we do a lot of this, but I would probably more choose like power and politics and influence. Um, and uh, I think I referred to that a bit before, and this is very much linked to social capital as well. And I've, I, I find this uh, fascinating, and, and actually we are collaborating with the professors because there's lots of complementarity uh, in what we teach in terms of soft skills and how to navigate the ecosystem, as well as what they teach uh, in classes. So we need to make sure, of course, we, we leverage each other and we are complementary and not contradictory. But uh, we've been working with some of these professors teaching social capital, for instance, and it's really amazing because not only it's helping an individual to navigate uh, the organization. And so whether in between a sparse network or a dense network, it's going to help you climb the ladder. It's going to help you build the relevant partnerships internally because you have to work with so many stakeholders internally, but as well externally. And so this is where it's also so useful for now these days when you are, I mean, when you work with um, uh, on projects where you have to build a lot of relationships, so around BD, account management, sales, etc., uh, in different sectors, you have to be able to be at ease in navigating again. Uh, I mean, uh, this ecosystem of, of key players. So you have to either, as a corporate partner with startups or incubators to continue innovate, you have to look at private public uh, partnerships, depending on, on the sector you work uh, with, whether it's highly regulated, you may have to work with associations or governments. And so this importance of uh, having the right network for your business, what you're doing, but as well for your future career, uh, is 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 an important asset. So social capital remains uh, one of the best assets to get equipped with, I think, whatever the program you do. Right. Well, uh, the French presidential election is only, what, 18 months away. So you need to sign up for that course on politics and power soon, ready to launch uh, your campaign. Uh, Liliana, with, with all of the edX students, whether they're taking, you know, the master's in business analytics, the master in finance, the master in management, if, if we were to ask them five years later, you know, which was the course that, that you remember? I don't know if it would be technical skills. It, it, you know, sometimes it's like, well, actually, the people I remember were in the career services team because they held up this mirror. They, they, they helped me to unlock you know, me uh, and, and the path that I wanted to take. What, what, what sort of feedback do you think that you would get from uh, EDEC graduates? Is, what might be a, a, an aspect of the program that they would really remember? To be honest, I'm, I'm really not sure how to answer because I've been asking this question to students that I've known for a few years now, and I'm getting different uh, answers. So the one thing, I think everyone experiences uh, education differently. So they're, uh, they remember professors, uh, they remember, as you say, the, the team. Uh, a lot of them remember the admissions team throughout, even though we don't really see each other that much after um, after they've uh, started their studies. Um, but I, if I may, I would uh, go back to your previous question because that really took me and I, I wanted to, I started thinking which course I would, uh, I would join if I had the opportunity. Um, and I think it was last year we launched a course about um, sustainable finance. And I found this really interesting um, because it's a comprehensive course and not so often do we think about finance as the solution to, to uh, climate change issues, um, but um, we think that this could be a big game changer in a few years in, I mean, in the financial sector. So I would be really curious because I've studied um, 
environmental economics is a subject that we need, but I haven't been able to link this to, to financial solutions because it's not my, uh, my expertise, but I would be very curious to follow this course because I believe if this is one of the solutions, then this is a course that would probably really look into the future, not only in terms of job openings, uh, but also what could make a change. So well, if this panel is, is, is anything like the, the careers panels we've been doing at Centre Court, I think uh, the last one we did with, with Agnes and others, uh, there was something like 85,000 people that watched. The, so, so now everybody knows the course you'd like to take, and I'm sure that word will get back to Emmanuel, the Dean and others, and so you won't even have to mention this at the annual review. I think they will probably uh, offer you uh, that sustainable, at uh, the place, place in the sustainable finance course. Perhaps I just wish one I had final... the time to think it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's finding the time, that's right. Well, well one, one final question. I, I saw a quote on LinkedIn yesterday, Megan, that I really liked. It talked about you know, someone that's reached a, a point perhaps of success and it said, uh, just remember those who built the ladder. You know, you've climbed the ladder. Remember the people that built the ladder. Humility in all of this. You know, we, we, your, your five wonderful schools attract incredibly talented and ambitious, open-minded uh, individuals. Humility, does it play a role? Is it something that uh, recruiters also then look for? Absolutely, I think it's the sign of a good leader. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. So you can't get there to the top alone. You need people to lift you up, to push you up, to support you, to step in if you're unable to do something for whatever reason. So I think it's always important that people remember where they came from and how they got there. Um, and I certainly think that to be a good leader, you know, especially in this day and the climate and everything that's happening currently around the world, you definitely need to not be afraid to admit when you're wrong, not be afraid to ask for help, um, and, to, and to be able to admit that you might not have all the answers, but that there are other people around you and you surround yourself with those expertise as well to not only be a better leader, but to build a better team. Mm, yeah, it's, it's interesting with the, the interviews that we've done with your uh, alumni, uh, talking to, to your colleagues, uh, this sense every, everyone has had it you know particularly challenging in the last seven eight months how people have uh, adapted and, and talking about you know new students coming in in september in some cases second year students returning in september and they said we've really noticed just a sense of, of gratitude you know yes it's difficult but you know you as schools everything that you do the, the, the innovations that you're taking whether it's on a virtual platform to be able to continue to support us so let me uh, learn from the gratitude that uh, your uh, energetic students show uh, and express my gratitude on behalf of the team at Centre Court for, for the past 60 minutes with all of the, uh, the insights and that positive en energy that you've shared. Uh, good luck in that career in politics, uh, Agnes. Um, but yeah, to, to Megan, to Liliana, uh, Julie, Michelle, Agnes, thank you very much for joining us at, uh, at Centre Court and I'm sure that those that are with us will now enjoy asking some more specific personal questions to you in the chat rooms. But thank you very much, all five of you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.